Three little birds sat on my window And they told me you don't need to worry Summer came like cinnamon, so sweet Little girls double dutch on the concrete Maybe sometimes you feel afraid But it's alright, the more things seem to change the more they stay the same Don't you think it's strange? Girl, put your records on and Tell me your favorite song You go ahead, let your hair down Sapphire and faded jeans I hope you get your dreams Just go ahead, let your hair down You're gonna find yourself somewhere Somehow Blue as the sky, sunburnt and lonely Sipping tea in a bar by the roadside Don't you let those other boys fool you Gotta love that afro hairdo Maybe sometimes you got it wrong But it's alright, the more you seem to change the more they stay the same Don't you hesitate Girl, push your records on and Tell me your favorite song You go ahead, let your hair down Sapphire and faded jeans I hope you get your dreams Just go ahead, let your hair down You're gonna find yourself somewhere Somehow, life's more than I can take Pity for pity's sake Some nights kept me awake I thought that I was stronger When you gonna realize That you don't even have to try any longer Do what you want to Girl, put your records on Tell me your favorite song Just go ahead, let your hair down Sapphire and faded jeans, I hope you get your dreams. You go ahead, let your hair down. Girl, put your records on, tell me your favorite song. Just go ahead, let your hair down. Sapphire and faded jeans, I hope you get your dreams. Just go ahead, let your hair down. You're gonna find yourself somewhere, somehow. Lying in my bed, I hear the cock tick and think of you. Caught up in circles confusion is nothing new flashback warm nights almost left behind suitcase of memories time after sometimes you picture me I'm Walking too far ahead You're calling to me I can't hear what you said And you say go slow I fall behind The second hand unwinds If you're lost you can look And you will find If you fall, I will catch you, I'll be waiting Time after time If you're lost, you can look and you will find me Time after time If you fall, I will catch you, I'll be waiting Time after time After my 
picture fades and darkness has turned to gray you're watching through windows you're wondering if i'm okay secrets stolen from deep inside the drum beats out of time if you're lost you can look and you will find me time after time if you fall i will catch you i'll be waiting time after time if you're lost you can look and you will find me time after time if you fall, I will catch you, I'll be waiting Time after time Time after time Time after time Hello everyone, welcome to Eat, Drink and Be Giving at Home. My name is Abby Smith. I'm the Director of Programs at Skookum Kids. I am so sad to not be physically with you all tonight. There is something about seeing a sea of faces that are committed to foster kids and their families that encourages me for the rest of the year. But as an organization that is big on family, we are beyond honored to be invited into your living room to share a few stories and let you in on what we've been up to. This year, we've accomplished some big goals and set some new ones. Just like all of you, 2020 threw us some curveballs, but sometimes it's in the midst of chaos when your purpose becomes the clearest. This spring, when we were all ordered to stay home and stay safe, it became abundantly clear that home is in everyone's safe space. As we suddenly became obsessed with sourdough starters, making cloth masks, and debating whether or not Carol Baskin fed her husband to that tiger, there were many kids that were sent home from school this March to take shelter in a house that wasn't safe. I know that none of you are okay with that, which might be why you're tuning in tonight. At Skookum, we are in the business of creating, sustaining, and redeeming safe spaces. You have likely heard many stories of Skookum House, a place where kids come to rest and play and eat too much ice cream while dancing to the Frozen soundtrack. It's a place where they are safe to be a kid and safe to be sad or mad or relieved about being there. We also get to celebrate and sustain the safe place that foster parents create in their families. We have the enormous privilege of watching foster parents stretch and grow themselves to become what children with trauma need them to be and to watch kids from hard places flourish in their care. Our Skookum Parents team gets to cheer them on hand them water, and talk them off a few ledges, and you'll get to hear some of their incredible stories tonight. At Skookum, we also believe in redeeming safe space. Tonight, we'll get to talk a little bit about visitation, which can be a scary word in the foster care world, but one we believe is full of hope and restoration. What if while kids are being taken care of in the safe places we built for them, a team of people were wrapping around their first home, giving their parents the grace, tools, and relationships that they need to become the very best place for their kids. If you're joining us tonight, I'm guessing that you too are a big fan of hope and redemption and of making sure our community has safe places for kids to take shelter. You've come to the right place, but we can't do it without you and we're so glad that you're here. There was a knock on the door and in walked a social worker with this two month old baby boy with bright green eyes. His eyes were so wide as if he had seen a ghost. The social worker had us sign a few documents and she was out the door. He did not have any emotion while my wife held him and he just stared. I couldn't imagine how he must have been feeling. His whole life just drastically changed and he was way too young to comprehend the situation. The only thing I knew was he was scared and his mom could not be there for him. It took him a couple of weeks, but eventually this baby who had no emotion started to smile. He started to kick his legs. He started to look at us as if he knew he was safe. His mom was not healthy and was not engaging with a social worker, so visits never happened for this little green-eyed boy. And a dad had not been identified. 
The bonding my family and I grew with our green-eyed boy did not take long. He instantly became our baby, and there was not a speck of difference between the love we had for him and our biological kids. We got to watch him learn how to crawl, take his first steps, eat his first real food, go on his first Disneyland trip, and say his first word. His first word was my son's name, and my son still likes to remind us of that. I quickly like to remind him that the only reason he said his name first is because we are always saying his name when he's not behaving. Close to our green-eyed boy's first birthday, we got a call from the social worker saying that his father had been identified and he would be starting visits with him. I brought our green-eyed boy to the office and saw a man sitting in the waiting room. I introduced him to his son for the first time and he just stared at him while he was sitting in his car seat as if he was in shock. Our green-eyed boy gave him the same emotionless look that he had given us when we first met him. I hated leaving him with a stranger, but the social worker hurried me out of the office and said to come back in, an, in two hours. To our surprise, his dad showed up to every visit. Two times a week, our green-eyed boy and his dad would sit in the DCYF office together, reading books, playing together, and trying to make up for time that they had lost. After a few weeks, our green-eyed boy's dad decided he was going to do whatever it took to be a parent to his son. We realized that to support our green-eyed boy, we needed to support his dad, and that meant getting to know him. One day, I was picking him up from a visit and I blurted out, we go to church in Bellingham on Sundays. You're welcome to come with us and hang out with him after church for a little while if you'd like. The next Sunday, he was there with his family, making sure to get any time with his son that he could. As we were saying goodbye after church, I heard myself say, I'm going to start the grill if you want, you and your family can join us at our place for lunch. My wife was mortified. The car ride home was a little rough, but it didn't take long to start the grill and get to talking. At the end of our time together, I clearly remember telling my wife, I'm going to make this guy my best friend. I wanted him to be my best friend because I knew he was going to do everything he could to be a parent to his son. And I wanted to make sure we got to be a part of that too. His dad continued to show up to every other opportunity he got to see his son. We were able to watch him play and care for his son, and his son grew to love him and wanted to be with him. We started talking during the week and going out to lunch. We started texting each other and even started going on double date nights without the kids. I also started going to court with him as he fought to get his son back. Even though it was hard on my family and I, I knew it was the right thing to do. Being able to watch him interact as a father and seeing the connection he built with his son truly opened my eyes to see that our green-eyed boy really needed his dad and his dad really needed him. On his last court day, I spoke to the judge about what an amazing father he was and how good of a friend he had become to me. The judge signed off on our green-eyed boy returning home. I cried, which is no surprise. And when I looked over at his dad, this tough guy had tears running down his face too. I told him, I'm so happy for you. It is just going to be hard for us because we love him so much. Two years later, I can sit here and tell you that our green-eyed boy is doing fantastic. And his dad is my best friend. Over the years, he has installed kitchen appliances for us, fixed our cars, and we were even able to go on a Disneyland family vacation altogether. His wife cut my hair yesterday so I can look good for this event. Our green-eyed boy is still our green-eyed boy. We just had to realize that love does not set limits on the number of people that it attaches to. He now has two families who love him and want what's best for him, but he wouldn't have had that if his dad wasn't given the gift of spending time with his son. I've gotten to see firsthand the joy and life that comes with restored families. All of the research says that children do best in their families of origin. But if we are going to take that goal seriously, it means we need to take visitation seriously. We need to care for the bonds between kids and their parents so that they are strong when it is safe for them to be together. We need to see visitation as a time to encourage biological parents to do the hard work of mending what is broken and healing what is unhealthy. Visitation is a part of foster care that doesn't get much press but it is the biggest way we get to support a child's relationship with their first caregivers. I get to oversee the best team of visit supervisors in this state. I'm not just saying that they are the best because they are part of my team. I'm saying that they're the best because they are. They are compassionate, they are committed and creative, which has made them all stars in the face of a pandemic. When COVID arrived in our state, one of our visit supervisors immediately downloaded Zoom and was helping bio parents get connected before anyone had time to panic. The department later asked us to train other agencies across the state on how to quickly and effectively start on managing virtual visits. Our quick movement wasn't because we're tech wizards, but because we knew that in the face of chaos, keeping kids from their people wasn't an option. 
We were intentional about having a plan on how to do in-person visits safely. So while we waited for the green light, we stocked up on cleaning and sanitation supplies. We brought thermometers. We started talking about where we can facilitate these visits. And thanks to Skookum supporters, we had an abundance of masks provided to us. When the governor's stay home, stay safe order ended, it was a Skookum visit specialist named Rachel who supervised the first in-person visit in the state to make sure a two and a half year old girl got to say goodbye to her mom. This small girl had been doing video visits with her mother from a treatment center for a few months. If there's a toddler in your home, you might have an idea of how hard that was. Her mother was just out of treatment and needed to leave the state in order to get herself healthy. Without hesitation, our visit specialist said she could make it happen. She set up a safe outdoor visit for them in a park in town where they got to actually play together for the first time in months. And that child got to spend the day in the physical presence of her mother, laughing and playing in the sand. We did this because we know what's best for a child is to be with their parents, and that time spent together is what makes healthy families. We hope that whenever possible, the kids in Skookum Care end up like our green-eyed boy, at home, safe with the parents who were given the opportunity to love and care for their child well. Hey everybody, my name is Alex. I'm a foster care specialist here at Skookum Kids. And today with me, I have Lee Ann and Peter Marshall. And Lee Ann and Peter, you guys have been um, licensed with Skookum for about two and a half years now, correct? Yep, that's right. Awesome. And we are here today to really just talk about their experience. Um, they are really great foster parents and have quite a story to tell you. So to get started, um, I really just wanted to ask you before we jump into what your experience has been like, what were some of your preconceived notions or expectations of foster care before you got your first placement? Um, my parents were foster parents. Um, and so I didn't have, I already, had some expectations of what it was going to be like as far as where the kids were going to be coming from, the challenges that we were going to face, whether from the, the placements or even from the biological families. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't really have, I don't know, I wouldn't say it's not that I didn't have any preconceived notions, but they're pretty educated preconceived notions. Yeah. So. And I think for me, like we weren't strangers to foster care, but I, um, um, I would say that I didn't think um, that when we were taking in foster kids that we were really going to be dealing very much with biological families. I just kind of was like, we're just taking a kid and we're going to be anonymous people who are taking care of this kid and then we're going to do whatever needs to be done, but we're not really going to get involved in any other way. That was my impression of what it was going to be like. <laughs> and boy, were we surprised. We were wrong. <laughs> Yes, you, yeah. um, from what I was talking to you about <laughs> earlier, and I would love if you shared with everybody too, um, you kind of jumped into it with your first placement. <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, our first placement, we didn't have any contact with the biological family for the first maybe six weeks or so. Um, and then uh, the social worker came for a visit and um, was like, well, we would like him to attend cultural events. And this was a baby. He was, I think, 11 months, 10 or 11 months at the time. Months. Yeah, and uh, she's like, we want you to get him, you know, connected with his culture and take him to cultural events. Um, and so we're like, oh, like, oh, okay. And it felt a little uncomfortable, if I'm being honest. And um, so we went um, down to Lummi for uh, an event on a weekday um, in the evening. And when we got there, we found out, along with his biological parents, that the event was canceled. And so we ended up just spending the evening together. Um, it was just me and the baby. Peter stayed home with our bio kids. Um, and so I just spent the evening with his biological parents and um, at the park. And we just played and talked and got to know each other. And that was nerve-wracking at first, um, yeah. but really sweet. And we've been able to stay in contact with them um, since reunification, which is fun. That's great. So you guys are two for two then, because you are, <laughs> your yeah. second placement you had in your home for um, about two years. 18 months. You're 18 half. months, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. okay. And um, you were really close with him and his family. Um, could you tell me a little bit about him and what it was like to have him in your home? And then we'll jump into um, a little bit about the family. Yeah, Yeah. he was so sweet. He, was, he is so sweet. Um, generous, loving. Um, he was definitely uh, a little bit delayed, but uh, caught on quickly at the same time, or yeah. quickish. 
and uh, and but just had just a wonderful spirit. And oh, an infectious laugh. It, oh. He could make an entire room yeah. just crack up yeah. by laughing. It was yeah. adorable. I would second that a couple of times that I was at yeah. your home and he would say things and <laughs> everyone would just be like, did you say that? <laughs> so yeah. cute, so sly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's really sweet. Awesome. And um, that was different than from your first placement because he was quite a bit older. So he really fit in with your family, too, and was able to make those connections. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me a little bit about his relationship with your kids? Mm -hmm. He was almost six when he was placed, and then our bio kids were five and seven. So he was right in the middle. And um, is that right? I think five and yeah. And um, so he got on really well with our youngest, and they just kind of became attached at the hip for a, a year and a half. Yeah. <laughs> and, and yeah, I mean, it wasn't a perfect you know, they didn't have perfect relationships, right? They've definitely fought like brothers. And there were arguments and chaos and everything <laughs> else. But um, but he kind of just fit right in, you know, I would say, like yeah. with, the, with our bio kids. Yeah. Definitely. Mm -hmm. I remember all three of them running around almost every single time I would come over. Yeah. <laughs> Do yes. you want to play this? Do you want to play this? Can we go outside? <laughs> yeah. 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 A little bit of chaos all the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is good, though. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and you were able to then create really good relationships with his birth father as well as his birth sister because his birth sister had the rest of his siblings. Could you talk a little bit about that? So his, um, he has four biological siblings and the, the way we were connected with them to begin with um, was the social worker mentioned that one of those bio siblings was living in the same area as us and, um, and was actually going to school that was just right next door to where he was going to school. So we were like, well, let's meet up after school at the playground and, you know, and, and just kind of make some of those connections. And, um, and that's how it started. And then it was fairly easy from there um, because we just kind of grabbed phone numbers and we invited them to come over and go trick-or-treating. Um, and we, we kind of fell in love with them. I oh, mean, yeah. <laughs> we, went, we would go down to the beach and yeah. hang out with them at the beach yeah. and have and they're just sweet. And roast marshmallows. And yeah, I just really sweet did, people. But, and yeah. they were really excited about having a relationship with us and our family. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I spoke with the oldest sister who has custody of the younger sister um, yesterday or the day before. And she, she was just saying that she felt like um, it was important for all of us to be connected because it made it seem for our foster kid um, like we were just one big extended family mm -hmm. as opposed to separate families doing separate things. Like we could just function as one yeah. family. And that was really important for everyone, not just for the foster kiddo, but for them, you know, and for us, I think. Yeah. They were really just great to talk to as well and just kind of support each other through support each other through hard times yeah. and because and, and, it's not like they're going through an easy time either no so. and yeah. they provided insight for us yeah. into their family and into our foster kid I mean there were so many things that they that just made it easier yeah. for us to understand who he was as a person like Halloween I remember he was so excited he, he <laughs> might have thrown up so but he was so excited everybody was there his families were there together yeah, so terrible. yeah so, yeah. Still went trick or treating though. Still made it. <laughs> he didn't wear a costume. We did didn't but wear a costume. Most important part. Yeah. yeah. That doesn't necessarily surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> when we talk about Halloween, that's always the story that comes up. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. I'm not going to wear that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the costume. You don't anyway. have to. <laughs> no. Um, and that insight then, I'm sure, helped with your relationship with his birth father. Can we talk a little bit about that as well and kind of how you started to facilitate that? Yeah. The relationship with birth dad was a little bit more complicated um, and I was a little bit more resistant to involving him in our everyday life. Um, so that was a slower process, right? Building trust with him was a little bit more challenging, um, but it kind of started with us just driving our foster kiddo to and from visits and then just having short conversations and being willing to share the things that our foster kiddo was doing at school or with his health. and. And then inviting him to doctor's appointments and school mm -hmm. appointments and being open to that, um, which again, was that was a big stretch for me um, to sit in a doctor's office with him and, and have to talk about all of the developmental problems or issues. Um, was It was challenging, um, to say the least. But, um, but as time went, you know, I think that um, we just got to know each other a little bit better and we facilitated phone calls and, and then as reunification became something on the table, um, 
we got really involved and um, would take our foster kiddo to um, where he was going to be living with his dad and got to see his home and we took him to his school and you know and, and made sure and then it was a lot of just um, really supporting them making sure that he had all of the medical information and all of the school information and all of the things um, that he needed um, yeah. so it was a it, yeah it was a process yeah for sure and still is I yeah. would say yes you know. definitely mm -hmm. and I appreciate you sharing that um, there's always going to be ups and downs in those relationships we would be lying if we said that they were always perfect right. the whole time. Um, so it is important to hear both sides, I think, because it does shoot, show what's really true and honest and mm -hmm. what foster care really is like. And I really love kind of how you guys have said you, that there are some ups and downs, and but it's important because of the relationship you can kind of continue. And I would love it if you could share a little bit about how you've continued that till now. Well, we've had... Uh, our placement come up and our foster kiddo come up and, and stay with us. A, a, oh gosh, what four or five times now? Quite a few times. Yeah. yeah, so he's come up and stayed the night and hung out and. Well, and that was that was one of the neat things when um, so he went home right at the beginning of COVID, mm -hmm. right, and so then we didn't get to see him for a while. Um, but then when Bio Dad had to go back to work, um, there they had childcare problems. And so we had been talking with him, and so we were able to take our old foster kiddo um, for you know a few days during the weeks, you know, in the summer, just to help support his dad with childcare um, and make sure that that they had the time and the space they needed to figure out um, what to do, yeah. you know, which I thought was pretty, um, which was a nice way to support them again, you know. And his dad is really, really, really on board with us staying in touch, um, which is a big deal, and it's yeah. a big deal for everyone you know it's a big deal for me and for peter because we obviously love this child like our own um but then for our biological children because they were so close um and it was so hard to say goodbye um but we just got to say see you later which is nice and um and then i think that it's huge for our foster kiddo because um he had been in multiple placements i think six by the time he got to us and I, he just needed something permanent he needs permanent relationships and we want it to be a permanent relationship. Yeah. And then we, we also have FaceTime conversations with him too, and making sure that we mm -hmm. are talking to him still and he sees our bright, shiny faces and we can check in on his well being and <laughs> maybe be a bit nosy. Yeah, we so. are nosy, but it's, you know. You're nosy. I'm, I am. I'm like, uh, where are your glasses? <laughs> Why aren't you wearing them? <laughs> it's but, support, it's not nosy. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, We're very supportive then, yeah. especially her. There we go. So. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's re been really inspiring for me to watch that happen um, and for Skookum to be a part of it. So to wrap up, how do you think you have really grown in your foster care experience? Nothing surprises me. <laughs> <laughs> joking. Um, I don't know. What do you think? Um, <laughs> how to communicate was, we, we were talking about this, communicate how I communicate um, knowing that there's different ways to come at it and to talk to a, a, not only a foster kiddo, but my own. Mm -hmm. uh, and being able to handle that I think was really important. Uh, and being patient and loving unconditionally, I think mm -hmm. too, because I had a hard time loving the, the bio dad at first yeah. um, and just being able to overcome that and yeah. thinking of what he's done, but what he's trying to do. and. Yeah overcoming that so mm -hmm. yeah and, and I think to take on to that um, you guys had encouraged us to do a training um, that we did I don't remember what it was called now but something that one of the speakers said really stood out to me that um, kids that are in foster care you know maybe didn't have this right as a baby they didn't have the love and support they needed um, but maybe they didn't have that love and support because um, their parents didn't have that love and support and so when we look at the parents you know we also have to think of them as needing this you know like needing to be cared for and needing to be loved um, and accepted and supported you know and and that was not like I said before, it was not something I was prepared to do, um, I think, with parents at the beginning of foster care, but really have learned that that's a huge part of it, you know. That's pretty special to learn to love in a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what's next? I know last <laughs> time we talked to you, Peter was really into the teenagers. <laughs> no, I'm open to anything. I got into fostering because I read a story of a 17-year-old who just said, 
he said, uh, I just want some, I just want a home. Mm -hmm. I just want a family yeah. and that broke my heart. And yeah. so, um, cause when well, we first started, she was closed off to anybody older. And I was like, well, I don't think, cause I believe that God might have a plan for us here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we need to be open to whoever God brings into our lives and we yeah. should just, yeah, but yeah, I think I'm happy with whatever from <laughs> zero to 17. Yeah, so, our, well, our kids are zero. I don't want zero. And we don't want zero. <laughs> <laughs> we are over diapers and midnight stuff. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm but our old. kids are still young. So, you know, but we, we're just, I think at this point, we're just open to whatever God has for us next, you know, and we, we just don't have any idea what that's going to be. <laughs> wow, I look so forward to it. You'll have to call us. <laughs> yeah. We'll do our trip to California and then we'll be ready. To, then we'll talk. Great. Ready to go back, to, which is yeah. in two weeks. So Perfect. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing. So thank you. Sure. You're welcome. My name is Jordan Mahoney. I kind of decided as a single person, probably three years ago, that I needed to stop waiting for somebody else to come into my life so that I could start pursuing what I really wanted. I've, I've always wanted to be a mom. I've been involved with Skookum Kids since around the time of the King's Kaleidoscope concert. They just really got a hold of me and had me start volunteering at Skookum House. It didn't seem like it was going to be possible for me to get involved with really diving in with my hands. It turns out that that was uh, wrong. You can, you can be pretty involved as a single person. I got a text message from my Skookum foster care specialist at like 12 o'clock on July 13th. And the text was, are you interested in a long-term placement with two boys? my pulse went through the roof. <laughs> like, um, I mean, that is my desired age group, two kids, this is all of a sudden becoming very, very real. Less than 48 hours from the time that I got the text, are you available, are you interested in these two boys? They were here. I went and picked them up and they now live in the room next to mine and they snore really loud and they're really great. But we do have some big feelings. Foster care involves trauma and trauma affects how we process the world around us. So my oldest is very, he's reluctant to be shown affection from me. I am, I'm not his mom. And he, he knows that. He is very aware of what's going on. He knows who his mom is. He knows who his grandparents are. And he knows that I'm not them. So one of the sweetest moments that I've had with him was, was asking him why that is. Like, it's not because I'm not your mom. And he said, yeah, that's, you're not my mom. I'm like, babe, I know I'm not your mom. I'm your Jojo. And I love you so much. <laughs> and all of a sudden it was okay for me to say that because he knew I wasn't trying to take that place. I'm just standing in the gap. My job is to take care of you until your mom can take care of you. And your mom loves you so much. So she's doing all she can to get better so you can go live with her again. I'm not trying to be your mom. But I'm gonna be here until she's ready. <laughs> I have known quite a few foster parents who have been licensed just through the state and I, they must be saints. Like there, there is so much that Skookum does to really, really fill in gaps where I just can't be everything to everyone. My current foster care specialist, she is so responsive, which to me as the single parent, that is what I need. I need you to answer me right away, even if it's, I'm going to find out. Don't worry, I'll find out. The last thing I need is an email sitting for three weeks, which is a lot of what I get from the state and from the social workers from DCYF. They're great people, they work so hard, but they just have these huge caseloads. And right now, my caseload is not super dramatic, so I don't think I'm on the top of a lot of their lists, but I know I'm on the top of Skookum's list. You don't need to have a ton of extra time, a ton of extra money, you don't have to own your house, I rent. You don't have to work from home. I work outside of the home full time and sometimes overtime. You don't have to fit some cookie cutter suburban lifestyle with your own home with four extra bedrooms to be a foster parent. Skookum does a really good job of just making foster care accessible for all walks of life. Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. If we haven't met yet, my name is Ray. I serve as the founding director at Skookum Kids, and it's my task now to tie everything we've heard together, <laughs> ask for money, and send you off with glad tidings of good cheer. So let's see how we do. You know, foster care as we know it today began in 1853. 
It's not that long ago. A faith-based agency in New York City called the Children's Aid Society would take in abandoned or orphaned children from the city and place them with families willing to provide the children with a good life and an education. But by 1854, that's less than a year after the organization was founded, they concluded that there were not enough families to care for all of the children in need. Too many children, not enough homes. And that has largely been the story of foster care ever since. Too many children and not enough homes. It was certainly one of the major reasons why Skookum got started in the first place five years ago. On July 10th, 2015, the first children arrived at Skookum House. Now, that's a big deal because 57% of nonprofits fail in their first five years. And frankly, we've come close a couple times. But here we are, still standing. And not only that, we have largely accomplished everything we set out to do. Back then, when people would ask me uh, why we were starting something new, I pointed out some problems in foster care. Specifically, I would point at something that I called the death spiral. What was happening at the time was when children were entering foster care, especially outside regular business hours, you know, evenings and weekends, there was no safe place for them to go. So kids would wait for hours or days in the DCYF office until a home, any willing home could be located for them. And everybody knew this was bad for kids. So often with that time pressure of a child waiting just on the other side of a cubicle wall, social workers would place children in whatever home they could find. Sometimes even knowing the children would not be a good fit in that home. This high pressure placement situation led foster parents to feel guilty for ever saying no to a placement call. But even when they say yes to a child who wasn't a great fit in their home, foster parents would feel like they weren't really part of the solution for kids because badly made placements tend to end badly. So foster parents were discouraged and quitting at an alarming rate. And since so many foster parents were quitting, there weren't enough homes, which in turn made it harder to find places to put kids. You hear the spiral, right? Not enough homes means we make bad placements, which causes foster parents to feel discouraged, so they quit, which means we have even fewer homes. And round and round we go, circling the drain. It was grim. But today, it works much differently. When children experience abuse and neglect in our community, and need a safe place to foster their development <laughs> while their parents get safe and healthy, Skookum House, our emergency shelter, is ready anytime, day or night, to welcome them with just 15 minutes of notice. We care for children at the house for up to a week, helping them to heal, begin to stabilize, while social workers locate, in an unhurried way, the foster home that best matches the needs and nature of each child. But the magic of Skookum House is that it's staffed almost entirely by volunteers. Men and women, just like you and I, who have other responsibilities and interests, who have learned about the need for this work and take it upon themselves to get some training and make themselves available a few hours each month. I, I like to say that Skookum House is like a volunteer fire department, except instead of putting out fires, we care for children in need. And a funny thing happens when people band together and do that kind of work. Some get a little giddy and realize they want to do more than a few hours each month. They want to do proper full-time foster care themselves in their own home. And when people try it, get a taste for what foster care is really like, they realize it's not as hard or scary as it's sometimes portrayed on TV. And so they go for it. And we can help with that. In addition to Skookum House, our emergency shelter, we also help families who want to become foster parents to successfully navigate the training and licensing process and thoughtfully, planfully place children in their homes that they are well equipped to care for. And it works. You hear the flywheel, right? People get involved at Skookum House, have a great experience, feel good about the good that they're accomplishing, and so they decide to become foster parents and feel even better about accomplishing even more good. So they brag about it to their friends who come volunteer at Skookum House, and round and round we go. 
That's the last five years, the first five years at Skookum Kids. We replaced a death spiral with a flywheel. And the effect on the foster parenting community has been profound. More families than ever are opening their homes to children in need. In fact, earlier this fall, the number of Skookum licensed homes in Whatcom County exceeded the number of state licensed homes for the very first time. And for a few weeks, we actually had a short waiting list for families, trained, licensed, and ready to go. That is, in our community, the number of foster homes was enough. Enough. That never happens. In fact, it is only the case in one single county in the entire nation. You guys, <laughs> we did it. Five years ago, I described that vision to many of you over a cup of coffee, and it felt a little silly. That's how you know you've got a great goal. If you feel silly saying it out loud, you know it's big enough. And I sure did. I felt like I might be overpromising what we could get done together. And yet, here we are. Mission accomplished. So, what's next? Well, first of all, we cannot go back to how things were. These gains have been hard won, and we must make them permanent. My 8-Minute History just now does not do justice to the degree of difficulty for what we've accomplished together. And it's because of you. There is a cause and effect relationship between your continued generosity and the fact that today, families and children in Bellingham who find themselves entangled with the foster care system in some way have a much better chance at a good experience and a favorable outcome than they had five years ago. You made that true. And we cannot stop now. We've talked about our mission as repairing the foster care system, as if Skookum is somehow outside the system tinkering on it. But that's misleading because somewhere along the way, we all became an integral part of the system. We raged against the machine, but today, we are the machine. This foster care thing doesn't work correctly in Bellingham anymore without Skookum. All of us, if you work, volunteer, foster, or financially support Skookum in some way, you are part of this beautiful, imperfect system for taking care of families and children that we call foster care. So. If we're not happy with how something works today, we need to look in the mirror. If we want the system to be better or different in some way, we need to be better or different in that way. So here's a thought experiment for tonight. If we were still that same scrappy bunch of outsiders looking up the big bad system with ambitions to repair it, what would we want to do? Or maybe said another way, what would 2015 Ray yell at 2020 Ray about on YouTube? <laughs> and I think there are two things. First of all, I would probably point out that 2020 Ray needs a haircut. And if you've been following along closely, you may recall that about a year ago, we started building relationships and laying the groundwork for a second Skookum house somewhere in central Washington. We're doing that because we have long thought this approach, you know, volunteer-centric emergency shelter that leads to foster care licensing, would work well in other places too. And sure enough, Yakima, Ellensburg, and the Tri-Cities are dealing with a foster care death spiral of their own right now. And we believe the same approach, which has brought so much good here, would have a similar effect over there. An advisory group of sorts, sort of like a proto-board has formed. And perhaps caught in a wave of nostalgia, I told that group, just like I did in Bellingham, that I would not get a haircut until we were operational in central Washington. I wasn't too worried, though. We were making great progress. And then COVID hit. And since March, we've largely just been waiting for the COVID situation to change in that part of the state. But recently, the advisory group made the difficult decision to shift its attention away from Yakima and place the emergency shelter instead 
in neighboring Ellensburg, where we can move forward right away with a location that will still be in range for children from all of central Washington. Watch for a uh, sudden surge of progress in central Washington and, and maybe even a haircut for me very soon. Second, reunification. You know, you've heard a lot about our effort on this tonight, but there's still work to be done. The rate at which children in foster care successfully reunify with their family of origin is just 51%. And that's not good enough. Families who get separated by foster care deserve better than coin flip odds of finding each other again. This is a tough thing to work on because we cannot control parents' actions. If parents continue to use drugs or neglect the needs of their children, the best we can do is place those children into safe homes where they will be loved and maybe adopted. But in the vast majority of cases, parents and children both desperately want to rebuild their family. And both parents and children need some support to make that possible. So what does it take to help a family like this reunify? Well, you've heard several examples of it tonight. Consistent, high quality family time, brave, creative co-parenting, timely, grace-filled truth-telling, expansive ideas of community and family and hope. Bottomless, enthusiastic, reckless hope for everyone, kids and parents alike, caught up in these tragic situations. We've shared with you some highlights this evening, but these kinds of stories are still too rare. They need to become the rule, not the exception. Skookum has become a foster care agency, and in its next phase, I hope we can become a reunification agency. Five years from now, when we use the phrase foster care, it would be our goal that you imagine this brand of hope-filled, reunification-focused, whole family restoration. Five years from now, families whose children wind up in our care should breathe a sigh of relief, knowing that we are on their team and that our involvement in their story makes it much more likely that they will successfully reunite with their children. This is a revolutionary idea, a foster care system designed not to separate innocent children from evil parents, but to bind up wounds and bring whole family healing. And we're gathered virtually tonight because I'd like to ask you to fund that revolution. A pledge of support in any amount made tonight at skookumkids.org slash give will make you a vital member of this lean, mean, kid and family loving machine. Skookum is able to accomplish things that no other foster care agency has managed to pull off because this community supports the work with faithful generosity. I've said this before, but it bears repeating. Most of our peer agencies receive nearly all, 80 to sometimes 100% of their funding from the state of Washington. Skookum only receives 30% of its funding from those same contracts. And it's not because we get paid less. <laughs> it's because Bellingham gives more which enables us to go about foster care differently. We do the work that needs doing, not just the work that the contract will cover. Nearly 200 monthly givers provide a stable foundation of support on which we build all this hope and healing. And tonight, I'd ask you to join them at skookumkids.org slash give. Join them in making the next five years at Skookum just as revolutionary as the first five have been. Thank you again for coming. Hope and joy to us all. Have a good night. Remember me Though I have to say goodbye, remember me don't let it make you cry For even if I'm far away I'll hold you in my heart I'll sing a secret song to you each night
night we are apart, remember me. Though I have to travel far, remember me. Each time you hear a sad guitar, know that I'm with you, the only way that I can be. Until you're in my arms again, Cuando tengo que ir, mi amor, recuérdame. No llores, por favor. Te llevo en mi corazón y cerca me tendrás. A solas yo te cantaré soñando en regresar. Recuérdame. Aunque tenga que emigrar, recuérdame. Si mi guitarra es llorar, ella con su triste canto te acompañará. Hasta que en mis brazos tú estés, recuerda.